Good afternoon. Thank you for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Senior Drivers, Driving Safer, Longer. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For nearly four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, publications, retreats, research, and advocacy. If you'd like to learn more about us or access our online resources, please visit www.caregiver.org. Um, now for some quick housekeeping. During the webinar, uh, your phones or mics are going to be muted, so if you have any questions, you can ask them by going to the chat style question box at your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. We'll also be asking uh, for you to give us some feedback uh, after the end of the presentation, um, and we use this to help shape future education programs. So I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling those out. Um, we really do read those comments. So today I'd like to welcome um, Jared Seberg. Jared has over uh, 18 years of experience with the California Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, this includes a number of different uh, jobs and responsibilities, uh, including um, frontline work helping customers, uh, acting as an administrative manager in a public field office, uh, conducting hearings, and also training new employees. Jared also served as a driving safety hearing officer for over four years, um, and you're going to learn um, during the course of the webinar, learn a little bit more about the driving safety hearing officer and what they do. Um, in this capacity, he made contact with uh, numerous people all over the age of 65, uh, developed a strong rapport, of course, with them. Um, and, you know, while doing this, he was making sure that uh, they could continue to drive in California if possible, um, while also, of course, making sure that um, everyone was safe and um, uh, to maintain safety as a priority. Um, so Jared right now is the senior uh, driver ombudsman. He's a uh, one of five. Uh, his responsibilities as uh, the ombudsman uh, include acting as a go-between for uh, the people of California uh, with a particular specialty in helping senior drivers. Um, Jared's also a veteran with service in both the United States Army and the California National Guard. Uh, he was deployed for Operation Noble Eagle uh, 1 and 2. These were post 9-11 activations um, during his time in the Guard. Um, so now that you know a little bit more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Jared. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so as we can see, I've already talked. He's already talked a, a little bit about my experience. So I'm going to move into the Senior Driver Ombudsman Program. Uh, why it was created? Back in 2003, there was a gentleman down in Southern California, in Santa Monica, that inadvertently got gas and brake confused. He was 86 years old and he wound up killing 10 people and injuring over 150. At that point, the legislature, law enforcement, and DMV took a hard look at what, if anything, needed to be do, done about senior drivers. There were several proposals out there, including limiting uh, the license of senior drivers, saying that they couldn't drive after a certain age. And so several senior adv advocacy groups came forward and said, this is unfair to seniors. Uh, they're still safe to drive. And that's why my program was created. Uh, we basically have two purposes. Um, like it's been said, we act as a go-between. Uh, we can help seniors, caregivers, uh, doctors, family members, help them cut through the red tape of the uh, state bureaucracy. Uh, the other purpose is for us to go out and do outreach to educate uh, the public about our our program and also the process that many times is the reason why we're asked to uh, help. Uh, so those are our two biggest uh, reasons why we uh, were created. There are several reasons for contacting us. These reasons are just not for senior drivers. Several family members and caregivers often call us for this too. But requesting forms are information. Uh, any form that you find on our website, uh, I have access to and I can mail directly to you or to the senior in question, or just general information. Uh, like you said, I'm going to explain uh, what driver safety and what a driver safety hearing officer is later in this webinar, uh, or any general information. Every single senior ombudsman, driver ombudsman that's in California. And like he said, there's five of us. We all have multiple years. 
I happen to have the least amount of years of experience at, at having, I now have 19 years of experience with the DMV. We're all thoroughly trained in all aspects of the DMV and we can usually assist the customers when they ask for information on what they need to do on any part of DMV. Uh, this, the next reason has been referred to driver safety is the biggest reason we get contacted. Typically, nobody, uh, many people will not see driver safety. Uh, it's only if you get too many points on your records, if you have uh, driving under the influence, if you're involved in more than three accidents over a period of 12 months, or if you have a physical or mental condition. Um, those are the reasons why you're typically referred to driver safety because all of those components could affect your ability to drive safely and the safety of those around you. And so they call us to find out information about what's going to happen to them when they do get referred to driver safety. Uh, the next reason has to take a written test or drive test. Um, the written test has changed a little bit over the past couple of years. Uh, California is moving into the digital age, and so we now have touchscreen testing. And so many seniors call us and ask us about the touchscreen test and their options about the written test. Um, also, California monitors vision conditions, so conditions like glaucoma, a cataracts, macular degeneration. Many times when a person discloses that they have those conditions, we're going to ask for additional information. And if their vision isn't quite up to standards, we're going to ask them to take a drive test. And so the person contacting us or the family member contacting us or the doctor contacting us on behalf of their uh, patient, sometimes they're a little bit confused on why they have to take the drive test. Uh, and we also have information on how to help them uh, complete the drive test. And the last reason is obvious, you know, their privilege has been suspended. Uh, we got information from law enforcement, from a doctor, from a caregiver, from a family member, and it was enough for us to take an action. Uh, so driver safety uh, took an action, suspended their driving privilege, and now they're asking us the questions of how do I get it back or what are the steps I need to do to get it back. And so these are basically a lot of the reasons for contacting us. So what do I do or what do we do when we get involved? Uh, when it's contact by the driver, we provide them study material if necessary and we help them clear up any confusion over the process. Just like any other department or anything um, in the civilian world, people that work in that field for a long time get used to talking like they're in that field. So we try to break down the process and, and remove any kind of what we call DMV speak out of it and help them understand it as best as we possibly can. Uh, contact by family family, friends, or caregivers. Uh, so a lot of the times, the, per, uh, the family are the caregivers, but the, we ha do make contact with professional caregivers as well. We provide them information on alternatives to driving. Um, they'll contact us and say, hey, my father, my mother, they can't drive anymore. What are our alternatives so that we don't have to transport them all around all the time? A lot of senior groups in a lot of cities in California especially agency, uh, the agent area agency on aging have transportation op options. For Northern California, that's my specialty region. That's where I'm focused in on. Uh, whatever city you call from, I can usually find out information about transportation, whether it be uh, the local regional transit, uh, alternatives, senior care centers, anything like that. I can find a lot of alternatives to driving. And I also help them when they call me and say, hey, my, my mother, my father, or this person isn't so safe to drive with anymore. How do I go about doing that? I have information and I sit down and talk with them about starting what we have all know as the talk because many people over the age of 65, um, their driver's license is their independence. And we understand that if it is necessary to remove that privilege, there are a lot of things that are associated with it. So I can provide uh, anybody with information on how to initiate the talk um, about stop the, the stopping driving. Uh, we also provide information to family and caregivers on if nobody else is doing anything, 
about removing this driver off the road. We have a process, which I go over at the end of my presentation here, about how to report them directly to us so it at least will start an investigation on that person to see if they're still safe to operate. Uh, contact with health professionals, a lot of doctors several times, and I've had recent calls from the University of San Francisco uh, uh, Memory Center. They contact us directly, say, I have this client here, what do I do? And we explain the, the, the steps for healthcare professionals to get them to us so that we can do the evaluation on their driving. Uh, so a lot of the medical issues, and I said physical and mental at the beginning, these are the four biggest medical issues that the state of California Department of Motor Vehicles de deals with. That is seizures or loss of consciousness, diabetes, stroke, and then Alzheimer's disease or any other form of dementia. So with seizures or loss of consciousness, um, we work with healthcare professionals, specifically neurologists, and it's actually mandatory that they report to us by the health and safety code of the state of California. So what happens is, is if uh, a person has a seizure or they lose consciousness, uh, they report it to the local health department and then the health department in turn reports it to us as a potential loss of consciousness. And then we follow through with doing it at minimal an investigation. Uh, loss of consciousness, uh, this includes anything from a full-on grand mal tonic-clonic seizure to simple syncopal episodes which are just simply fainting. Um, with seizures, what we look at, if it's a first onset seizure, uh, we're going to ask that the person not drive for three months. And this is on the advice of neurologists um, because neurologists, uh, when we sat down and talked about what happens with a seizure, they said if a person has a first time seizure, uh, they are 66% more likely to have a recurring seizure within the first three months. So that's why we say if it's an initial onset seizure, we're going to ask that the person not drive for three months. We're actually going to suspend their privilege for three months, at which time they can go ahead and start the process of getting that privilege restored. Uh, when I first became a hearing officer back in 2010, uh, there was a law in the books that required that any time you had a loss of consciousness, uh, you were required to take a drive test to reinstate that privilege. Uh, since then, we have uh, refocused our efforts on any condition as a nexus to driving. It, can we tie the physical or mental condition to the ability of the person to operate a motor vehicle safely? And so when that law came up for renewal in 2012, we urged the legislature to let that drop because several people that had been out hiking in Yosemite and had um, just a simple dehydration incident, nothing related to driving. Uh, they were required to take a drive test, so there was no purpose in us testing them for their ability to operate a motor vehicle safely because their condition wasn't, we could not tie that condition to their ability to operate a motor vehicle safely. Uh, diabetes, diabetes is a shocker to a lot of people that we actually monitor this. Uh, both type one and type two, uh, we usually find out about type one diabetics early on when they first come and apply for their license because they'll tell us they're on insulin. And so that's a fairly simple process. It's still an investigation, but it's a simple process. Where this usually focuses in on is, uh, especially for those of us that are older, uh, is the type 2 diabetes, the adult, the adult version of the, of the diabetic condition, which is not the complete stop, uh, stop of production of insulin, but your body becomes what they uh, define as being resistant to insulin. And so what we look at are both the, the low and the high events that may have occurred. Uh, low blood sugar can cause a person to pass out. Uh, they can also do several other things. Same thing with the high, but usually a high uh, in, uh, blood sugar incident, they usually won't pass out as fast as they will with a low, but we monitor diabetes for both high and low and how a person is being treated with, with the condition. Um, 
if a person has type 2 diabetes and they're being able to control it with diet, exercise, and maybe one of the most common pills in the world, metformin, they're fine usually. We interview them, we see how well they're controlled, and we let them go. If it's insulin, we look at it a little bit harder. Uh, what's their insulin schedule? Uh, what do they do? Do they carry anything with them while they're driving in case a low event occurs? Stuff like that, we get a little bit more involved. And we really, really rely on the doctors in this case to evaluate current prognosis and control. Because it's really important for us to make sure that this person that we may allow to keep driving, the doctors have to give us as much information as possible. A stroke is one of those, uh, just like um, anything else, a stroke, we receive reports of both the cerebral and cardiovascular events from the health department. Our usual focus with a stroke is on the physical limitations or restrictions, treatment, and any outside aggravating fo factors. Uh, we really take a hard look at the physical limitations because a stroke, depending on where it can occur, as many of you know, uh, can affect different parts of the body or uh, different areas of the body. As a hearing officer for four years, I saw the full range of what happens when a person has a stroke. Um, one person came in, uh, the stroke occurred in the dead center of their brain and basically only affected their speech pattern. I've also seen ones where they've, they've had a stroke and they've, they still, even after physical, occupational therapy, and they've been doing the therapy for about four to six weeks, they still had severe physical limitations on one side. They still could not properly move the left side of their body. With a stroke, we're always going to ask for a drive test because even if you can fully recover from a stroke, some ability, uh, physical ability has been lost. So we need to make sure that whatever has been lost, you can still properly compensate for whatever has happened. With dementia and Alzheimer's disease, this is another one that is mandatory to be reported to us through the Health and Safety Code. What we focus in on with dementia and Alzheimer's disease is the mental attributes. Do they still have the ability to cognitively think about what they're doing, emotional stability, and knowledge? Uh, to a lesser extent, we look at physical requirements, but with certain types of dementia, their physical um, requirements will never be effective. We, it, it's a real focus in on what I said before, the mental attributes, emotional stability, and knowledge. Reaction time starts in the brain, so we really focus in on that. With dementia and Alzheimer's disease, what we look at uh, specifically is where it's at in this, where we're at in the process. Uh, again, the way we collect our information is from doctors, and when we came up with our three-pronged system to determine if a person can still operate a, a motor vehicle with Alzheimer's disease or dementia, we kind of broke it down into three areas on the advice of neurologists, which is mild, moderate, and severe. As long as a person with dementia or Alzheimer's disease remains in the mild category, we can allow testing to continue and we can monitor them. Once a person has reached the moderate or severe stages of, of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, that's when we say the person is long, no longer to safe to operate a motor vehicle and we, ask, and we actually revoke uh, the privilege. With dementia and Alzheimer's disease, we also put the person on what we call calendar reX, which that requires us, the DMV, to reevaluate the driver on a regular basis. That base that time frame can be anywhere from six months to twelve months, depending on what the doctor gives us as far as information as far as uh, the condition is. And this diagnosis we will always ask for a written and a drive test to make sure that they can retain, retain both the knowledge and the skill to be able to drive. So I've talked a little bit about our process and I've called it an investigation before I got to this slide. What we're really doing is re-examinations, okay? Re-examinations are simply the department's way to re-examine a person's ability to operate a motor vehicle safely. Uh, we've already gone over uh, a lot of the medical, uh, uh, so reasons a person can get referred by, to driver safety is through uh, medical information, 
This can be as simple as a letter from a doctor stating that this person has been diagnosed with this condition or from a caregiver. Law enforcement, uh, law enforcement uh, does routine traffic stops. Sometimes they stop a person for driving too slow, driving too fast, maybe weaving within the lane, or a lot of times the person is involved in the accident. The law enforcement officer notices that maybe something is wrong with the person. Uh, they may have some kind of condition, so they start asking questions. Law enforcement discovers that they have a condition. They report them to us for us to do the re-examination. Family members and friends, we always ask anybody, if you feel that you have a potentially unsafe driver, let us know, let us take care of it, let us do the re-examination. Uh, courts, a lot of people don't know that if a court places a person under a conservatorship, uh, the courts report that to us because if the courts have placed them under a conservatorship, that means they're no longer safe to handle their own affairs and we need to see if they're safe enough to drive on the road. And of course, healthcare professionals. I put that separate from medical because this includes caregivers uh, <clears throat> and, and, and the like, uh, chiroprac well, chiropractors are doctors, but anybody else in the healthcare profession that isn't a doctor, this is, this is where this wraps in because anybody, like I said, in, in any one of these areas can report a person to us and allow us to do our, our job as a re, uh, of the re-examination. So what happens during the re-examination? We are always going to ask for medical information. Our medical information is a simple five-page medical uh, form. Uh, the first page, the, the, the driver fills out for us. The last four pages, we rely on the doctor to, that is that has the most knowledge about whatever condition we're asking about to fill that out for us and give us information. There will be contact with the driver's safety hearing officer almost all of the time. Uh, what that is is you go before a hearing officer and you sit down and you talk to that hearing officer. We interview that person. Uh, this, this position is classified as an administrative law judge. Any person that comes before us to talk, we put them under oath and we record the contact for later purposes. Uh, sometimes we'll ask for a written test and um, sometimes we'll ask for a drive test depending on what condition it is. Like I said, this is general. These are the four phases of the re-examination. The first two will always happen. The last two are optional depending on what has actually occurred. <clears throat> so this is the general portion of a re-examination. <coughs> oh, sorry. I didn't see what I didn't see you move the slide. Sorry. So possible outcomes from the contact with driver safety. Uh, the hearing officer ultimately makes a decision based on medical information, results of the written test and the drive test, and the information collected from the driver. Uh, we can revoke, we can suspend, we can restrict their license. Um, the special instruction permit usually comes about uh, when a person doesn't do so great on the drive test and the person conducting the drive test for us kind of says, you know, maybe some professional pr uh, practice will help, maybe help them get over this ability to not pass our test. And so we issue a special instruction permit for them to practice their driving. Uh, we can place them on medical probation. This typically happens with seizures. Uh, that three month period I talked to, talked to you about earlier, what happens after that three month period is, is we want to make sure that there is a long stable period of control with that condition. So after that three months, we will look at putting the driver on medical probation, which just means they have to get us reports from their doctor on a regular basis. And we usually look at uh, putting a person on medical probation for about six months to, to uh, 12 months, depending on, on, on what we know about the, that condition. And of course, if somebody comes in, does fine on everything, passes the written test, passes the drive test, we get favorable information from the medical professional and uh, their interview goes well, uh, we will not take any action. Their license is not affected. So those are the, the, the choices that a, that a hearing officer has as far as what we can do when it comes time to make a decision from a re-examination. Uh, some of the tools the ombudsman provide throughout this whole process, study material for the written test. Uh, I have the most current handbook uh, for people. If they say I have to take the written test, I can send them a copy of the handbook. 
Uh, information from our business partners, this includes AAA, AARP, local area agencies on aging, and a lot of other places. Uh, I have information on local transportation companies. Like I said, you give me a name of a city, I can usually research it and get information on how what the transportation is like in that area. Local government programs. Uh, I work in Sacramento, so uh, the Sacramento area, I know about a lot of the local government programs. Uh, we can go over detailed information on contacts with driver safety. Like I said, we explain the process step by step uh, to the people and to the, uh, to the uh, care providers and everything like that. And like I said earlier, any basic DMV form for any type of transaction, whether it be driver's license or car related, if, if anybody can't find it, I usually can and I can usually send it out to them. So here we go, reporting a driver to the DMV. Through the health department, what we usually receive from the health department is what we call a confidential morbidity report. So what happens is a doctor, emergency room, hospital. Somebody comes in, they have to send something to the health department reporting that that person came in with this whatever condition came in. The health department receives all these reports and then in turn, the health department will see the ones that like loss of consciousness, maybe stroke, diabetes, or Alzheimer's, dementia. They'll see those, separate those from the rest before they file them, and they'll either email, fax, or uh, mail them to the local driver safety district office in their area. Uh, uh, so that's how we get information through the health department. Medical information, like I said before, this can be a simple letter on uh, from a doctor with you know their information, their address, and who they work for. It can also be several doctors already have our medical information, our five-page medical form, so they fill that out and send it in to us directly. A written letter, this can be from anybody. We've already talked about doctors, families, friends. Uh, we receive written letters from just about anybody. But just like the next one I'm going to talk about, the DMV's reporting form, Written letters, you have to attach a name to it for us. You cannot send it in to us anonymously. If you send something into DMV asking us to take a look at a potentially unsafe driver and your information isn't attached to it, we cannot accept an, uh, anonymous reports. We have to be able to know who's reporting it to us. We're, we're not allowed to take anonymous. So the DMV's reporting form uh, on our website, this is called uh, reporting a potentially unsafe driver. This is a very simple check the box form. Uh, it has boxes for medical conditions that you know about and driving habits that you've observed. And there's also a space for additional comments. You send this form in. This, as long as everything's signed, we are going to follow through and do a re-examination. Uh, on this form, uh, and I always joke with family members about this, if you want DMV to be the bad guy, let us be the bad guy. We have no problem doing that. But there is a way for you to keep yourself confidential. On that form, it has a confidentiality box, and you mark that saying, I wish to keep my information confidential from the driver. Uh, DMV takes that confidentiality very serious. Uh, what happens, it's treated just like uh, doctor-patient privilege or attorney-client privilege. Basically, it takes an order from a superior court for us to release that information to anybody else, including the driver. The only exception to that rule is, is if you are a medical professional and you are providing enough information on that report to us that allows DMV to take an immediate action, that's the only time we cannot honor the confidentiality of that request. So at this point, yeah, I know um, I know we're scheduled for like 45 minutes talking, but at that po at this point, I'm basically done with my presentation. If we have any questions, I'm uh, I'm ready to go. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Jared. Um, you know, Jared and I were talking earlier. Uh, you know, he mentioned that he did come down from Sacramento. If you're unfamiliar with the Bay Area, California, that's a uh, you know, it's a couple hours drive, and especially in rush hour traffic, uh, I think he was stuck for about uh, a couple hours trying to get down here. So really grateful. Um, he was able to um, stop by. Uh, we do appreciate that. 
Um, I just wanted to get into uh, one quick question about um, some of maybe the um, I, I know you have a, you know literature on this, but maybe if you could describe some of the uh, red flags for either um, physical or cognitive impairments, maybe some signs, subtle or otherwise, that might lead someone to believe that perhaps it's time to you know monitor someone's driving or maybe even uh, give you guys a call. Well, yeah, it's, it's the standard questions I would always ask. Uh, red flags, especially cognitive areas. Um, uh, you start noticing that they get confused around close family members or friends. Uh, you're driving with them, and they get lost in areas that they drive in all the time. Uh, those are two of the biggest red flags. Um, the biggest one, and people always deny this when they talk to me, but taking their medications taking their medications on a regular basis and remembering to take their medications. If they start faltering on taking their medications, uh, that's another big sign that something may be going on. Uh, what was the other part of that? For physical too? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, physical, uh, you know, maybe a pronounced limp that you didn't see before. Uh, the shuffling or the moving slower uh, I've found not to be a real good indicator or red flag because uh, before I became a hearing officer, I worked in the field office and I was a drive test examiner. And I had this gentleman that was about 95 and used a walker to move around. But once he got into the vehicle, he drove fine. His reaction times and everything were fine. So using the walker is not a real good uh, red flag. But if you notice maybe that uh, they're not using one side of their body over another, they're kind of neglecting a side, uh, that might be a good indicator that something physically is going on. Uh, those are the biggest ones I can think of. Okay, fantastic. Thanks so much. Uh, we have another question from a listener um, uh, who is from out of state, and uh, I don't know if you have the answer to this, but do you know if there are um, other um, programs similar to the California DMV uh, driver ombudsman, either a state or maybe a federal program um, um, that you might be able to use? Uh, I don't know if there's a federal program. And I know when the ombudsman uh, were first created, there was talk in New York. Uh, so my best uh, information to you is contact uh, your local branch of DMV, their website, and see if there's something similar to this in your state. Uh, we know that uh, the age 65 and older group is growing at a tremendous rate because uh, all of the baby boomers are now reaching that age. And so it's estimated by, uh, they said by 2020, California's population alone would be close to 16, 17% of those over the age of 65. It's actually happening faster because at last check, we were already at 14% of the state of California is over the age of 65. So this is a huge growing segment of our population. So like I said, I know California, unfortunately I can't direct you to anything else out of state. I don't know. Sure, sure. So yeah, that's that is yeah fantastic advice to yeah check um, their local DMV um, to give them a call. You could also give us a call. Um, check our website. Uh, we'd be uh, happy to maybe look that up for you. See if we can uh, dig up any information. Um, we have another question here. A pretty interesting question. Um, how does the DMV or, or um, so you mentioned you know restricted driving privileges? Maybe like you know no driving at night. How how is that actually monitored? Uh, it's monitored through law enforcement. Uh, what happens, uh, the most common restriction on our driver's license in California is, of course, uh, corrective lenses. So if you're driving around and you're stopped by law enforcement, they're going to ask for your driver's license. If you show them a driver's license and it shows the specific restrictions, because on our driver's license in California, the numbers are placed on the front of the driver's license, the restriction codes, those little numbers down there, on the back it actually explains those restrictions to law enforcement. So if a person hands them a driver's license and they're driving on the freeway and it says no freeway driving, they're driving outside their restriction. And then law enforcement will cite them and that can cause another reason for them to come back to driver safety to talk to us because driving out, outside of your restrictions or driving against your restrictions is also another reason to come into contact with driver safety. So if they get that ticket, they may have to come back to driver safety and explain why they were driving outside that restriction. Sure, sure, yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, I have another question um, from a listener, looks like in California. Um, 
She was concerned, I think, mostly about the um, the senior rights piece in terms of making sure that um, you know the ombudsman and, and, and the DMV is is working, doing their best to make sure that um, senior drivers kind of get a fair shake. So she was wondering, um, you know, what kind of resources um, that you or maybe that you know of are available to kind of help senior drivers drive safely. Um, and I know she also asked about some of the resources to help people. Um, kind of survive after driving. I know you mentioned that you could um, mm -hmm. call up a list from, you know, cities in terms of yeah. uh, alternatives for transportation. But yeah, if you could speak to maybe okay. these, um, some resources to help seniors drive safely. Uh, the first one, of course, is our uh, Senior Guide for Safe Driving. Uh, this was created once the Senior Driver on Busman uh, program was created. Basically, um, and people ask for it all the time and coming up to the written test because they think it's going to help them pass the written test, but it won't. Uh, the Senior Guide for Safe Driving was specifically designed <clears throat> to provide information, tips and tricks. We have mental exercises in there. We have physical exercises in there. We talk about uh, you know everything that goes on as far as driving and, and as we get older. Our reaction times slow down, and so we kind of go through that and explain that. We also provide uh, uh, tips and tricks. Uh, the, the funniest one I ever learned uh, when I first became an ombudsman, I had this gentleman come up to him and said, you know what, I haven't made a left turn in like two years because I found out three right turns make a, make a left turn. And I looked at him and he had to explain that to me. And then I kind of thought about it and I said, you're right. So, if, you know, stuff like that. If you're in a busy, busier area of California and you don't like turning left at particular intersections, you can make three rights and you'll get there the same way. Uh, we have come up uh, with uh, the local air agencies on aging. That, uh, we have... Uh, what we call our safe driving practices. It goes over, you know, make sure you see your vision doctor every year and it goes through all of this. Uh, we've also created a driver self-assessment uh, questionnaire and we ask you to look at it honestly. It has about 15, 20 questions. Does this happen when you drive? And if any of them do, we kind of ask you maybe, you know, you should get your driving reevaluated. Um, outside agencies, outside the DMV, uh, I mentioned our, some of our business partners. AAA has a program called CarFit. What AAA does is they sit you in your car and they teach you how to uh, properly adjust the car to you so it really fits you. It's called ergonomically fitting it, the vehicle to you. Uh, uh, AARP uh, has always led the way with education components. Uh, they have what they call their mature driver program. Um, here in the Bay Area, a lot of the ones that I've registered people for is usually a, a two-segment class. It's about eight hours total, but sometimes they do it all on a Saturday. Sometimes they split it up between two Saturdays. It just depends on when you sign up. But the cost is minimal. It's about $10, and it's a good refresher course for everybody um, over the age of 55 that hasn't you know, had to take a written test or had to do anything with the DMV for years. It goes over new rules and regs and everything like that. And here's, here's the plus to the Mature Driver Program. It's also the only program that is guaranteed if you take it to your insurance company, it, it should reduce your insurance rates for being a mature driver. Uh, CHP uh, also offers what they call Age Well Drive Smart classes. Uh, it, it goes through new regulations and kind of refreshers as well. Uh, and it's about a four hour course. A lot of the Age Well Drive Smart classes um, in my area in Northern California, I usually try to come in and do a brief five minutes, say, hey, I'm the senior ombudsman. Do you have any questions about DMV? And I, and I answer those questions because uh, CHP has found out a lot of people have more questions about DMV than they do about CHP. So we kind of work together with them on that as well. Um, uh, for the uh, transportation afterwards, um, usually, like I said, I talk with family members and I start asking them about their plan. What plans do you have uh, for this family member you know, if, if their privilege does have to be removed, you know, have you thought about it? You know, where, where are you looking at? And then depending on what city they are in, I can give them help to, you know, take the stress off of them being the caregiver and having to do the driving all the time, because we understand, you know, it, while it's their family member, it, it causes undue stress. Okay. We know it causes a lot of stress for the caregivers, and sometimes they just need to take a break away from being the caregiver. So, uh, 
you know, we provide them with information on alternatives to transportation and, and stuff like that. We even work with uh, a few other groups because um, I think one was saying, I really need a break. And I think I found them information on how to get a, uh, a breakaway, get a mini vacation for like three or four days and have somebody else step in and be the caregiver for a little while. They were fully licensed and everything like that. But what they did was they get, went around and gave family members that break that they absolutely needed from being the caregiver. Perfect, thanks. I actually uh, want to mention a, uh, a program. It's called the um, uh, National Aging and Disability Transportation Center. Um, it's funny, I was going to mention it, but actually someone from the, uh, the center actually just uh, sent a quick comment. Um, it's funded through um, Easter Seals National uh, Association of Area Agencies on Aging, um, U.S. Department of Transportation, and the Federal Transit uh, Administration. Um, and what you can do um, for caregivers, if you're interested, you can give them a call, um, 866 nine eight three three two 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 um, and they can give you uh, information like Jared might be able to in California about local options for um, rides or maybe local transportation options so that's um, National Aging and Disability Transportation Center a little bit of a mouthful eight six six nine eight three three two 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 um, I have oh one thing um, our senior guy for safe driving uh, has tons of websites uh, uh, and crossover information, uh, federal and local in California. So that's the whole end of the Senior Guide for Safe Driving is like if you have additional questions or you need additional information, it gives you tons of options for websites. And I believe theirs is listed in our guide as well. Okay, fantastic. Um, I have uh, another caller who um, who's actually, it sounds like they've started this process. You're actually a great uh, person to ask because I'm sure you, you'll be able to give a good answer. So this is a person, um, her husband um, was reported to the DMV by um, his doctor, of course, um, and this was at the family request as well. Um, and so he uh, failed a drive test twice, um, but then I guess what he did was he asked for another um, test. So what the DMV did was they sent... Uh, his doctor a report form. Um, now she's wondering, does this mean the whole process is going to start again? Um, and if so, why would the DMV want to continue um, continue this testing process? Because we're constitutionally obligated to do so. Uh, a lot of people think that the driving privilege is just that, it's a privilege. But our Supreme Court in the state of California and the Supreme Court of the United States has determined that uh, the driving privilege in itself is just like uh, a property right. So if, a, if we are going to take action against that privilege, um, we have to give them notice and, and we have to follow the Constitution. So we have to afford that person every opportunity to show us that they can operate a motor vehicle. Now with the process, so the way I understood the question, this family member is already suspended. They the way we suspend, it's not a set date. Uh, like if you get suspended for uh, too many points on your record, uh, it's a six month suspension. With a suspension for a physical or mental condition, um, it's an open ended suspension. So if we suspend and that person gives us new information, uh, we can always reopen. But at this point, uh, I can honestly tell you, uh, it's our decision. It's not his decision. They can send in the new medical information, but it's our decision, the DMV's decision, whether or not to reopen that case. Because if the information is exactly the same as we had before, we won't reopen that case. We will not reopen that case. We'll collect the new information, we'll look at it, and we'll say, this is the same as before, there's been no change, there's no reason for us to come back and take a second look at this person's privilege to operate a motor vehicle because nothing has changed. That's what we're looking at in this process. We're giving the person the opportunity to show that they can still operate a motor vehicle like we are required to under the Constitution. Great, fantastic. And I know it's, you know, on, on kind of both sides, it's some people who are maybe uh, more concerned about, they, they think maybe a driver is, is unsafe, so they're really, you know, kind of focused on getting them off the road. And other people, you have other people really concerned about, you know, being able to stay on the road and kind of that, that great balancing act that you, you all seem to be able to, to manage, you know, respecting senior rights, but also, you know, being thorough, being impartial, and, and making sure everybody who is driving is safe. So that's, um, I'm sure she was, um, you know, 
uh, that Ems explained a lot, and just the fact that it is in fact the DMV that is going to make the final decision, and just because maybe additional paperwork was sent doesn't mean that the case is necessarily going to be reopened. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, I just had kind of a question about um, kind of the driving uh, safety hearing officer. So I know yes. you mentioned it's they're essentially almost you know an, a, 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 a kind of an officer of the court. So they'll you know you have to, there's you know um, there, there's requirement for for truth and answers. Everything's mm -hmm. going to be recorded. But uh, you know other than that, I was wondering maybe what the time frame is in terms of decisions. I know sometimes there's additional things that that might need to happen, like you mentioned, like a driving test, but. In terms of maybe uh, a kind of time frame of how long this process may take, um, is it? Are we talking uh, weeks, days, months? Um, just kind of maybe generalities. Well, it, it honestly depends. Uh, typically, when we get the the first information, let's say we get a report from a doctor saying, "Hey, this person's diagnosed with this," uh, we send out the medical information to that driver, and we give them 21 days to get that medical information back to us. Okay, that's a set date. You have 21 days to get that medical information back to us. Once we get that medical information back, we review it. And if it needs to go forward for a re-examination, we, we try to schedule within the next 10 calendar days. Sometimes that's impossible. There's district offices here in Oakland and in San Francisco. That serves a huge population. Okay, And sometimes it's just physically impossible for us to get that person in there <clears throat> in that time frame. So what we do is we try to schedule the next available. So figure on average it might take two weeks from the date we get the medical information back to get the person in to talk. Once we go through the re-examination process, if we don't have to do a written test or a drive test, uh, and we can finish the contact right then and there, we are required to finish that contact within 15 days. In other words, write our report of our findings and our decision within 15 days after we close that contact. If we have to schedule a written test or a drive test and we schedule to a local field office, once we receive those reports back of what happened, then, then we have 15 days from that day to close it out. <clears throat> I would say on average right now, it takes about two months for us to complete everything uh, if, if everything goes well and we can get appointments in a timely manner. Great, fantastic. Um, I have a question from a professional. Um, I'm just going to probably read it out verbatim just so there's no confusion. So this person um, treats uh, patients with uh, dementia and she uh, says many of her uh, Alzheimer's patients, mild Alzheimer's patients, can actually pass the written test um, but are not uh, in fact given a drive test and she's wondering why this is the case. Uh, I'd like to know where she's doing this at because it's actually mandated in our regulations that if a person is diagnosed with that, we shall do a full re-examination, which includes a drive test. Uh, if you want to talk to me offline, my phone number is right down there below you. I'll be back in the office on Friday. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about whatever areas that, that's going on and see if there's anything that we need to do. But our regulations are very clear, written and drive test every time that we bring them back in, first time and every calendar re-examination thereafter. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, we have a question about the, um, actually from a listener, they're about to turn 70, it looks like they're in their probably late 60s, and they're wondering um, why they do have to take uh, a written test actually um, after they turn 70. <clears throat> okay, so remember when I first started talking how, I said how we were created, uh, what happened during that phase of DMV's career, uh, uh, DMV's lifespan, uh, we were looking at a lot of things. Like I said, we were looking at limiting driving, requiring drive tests every couple of years possibly, all these kinds of options. What came out of that with our discussions with not only legislature but senior advocate uh, parties, we looked at everything. So what we did and so it, what we found out is at age 55, and I know a lot of us in this webinar are probably – getting close to that age, if not over it already. Uh, what they look at is if something's going to happen, particularly in vision, uh, like cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, it will usually occur by the time the person is 55. If it does not, if you absolutely remain healthy, you work out every day, you eat right, and, and you're a perfectly healthy person, the chances go up exponentially once you reach 70 for something visually to happen to you. So what we looked at and 
what legislature passed was uh, we have what we call a renewed by mail program. And so what we what the legislation passed and what our regulation is is once you your first birthday after your 70th birthday then your license expires you're no longer eligible to renew by mail we want uh, and it specifically says that you need to come in take a photo and test your vision the that was the intent the unforeseen consequence of that was is the other regulation that we have on the books and it's been on our books since we were created as far as testing components is that if you come into the DMV field office you're required to take the written test. So that's what happened. Both those laws put together requires you to take the written test. And it's not that we say you're a bad driver or anything like that. It's just it's time, you know, for us to bring you in every five years. And that's what will happen. If you have excellent vision, no vision conditions, and you pass our test, you get the same full-term license. You get a five-year license in California. It's just you have to come into the field office and do this on a regular basis now. That's the way that's the way both those laws being put together uh, worked out. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's see. We have a uh, well, actually, a comment. I'll just <laughs> read it out. This is a uh, a woman who would like to thank the DMV uh, officers in El Cerrito and Oakland for their um, for their efficient and courteous treatment of uh, her husband. So. Um, she just wanted to uh, say say thanks. Maybe uh, if you're, I know it's not quite in your region, but maybe if you you stop by their office, you could you could give uh, give them uh, her regards. Absolutely. <laughs> um, let's see. We have a, a okay another uh, kind of uh, professional question. This is a, a non healthcare social worker, so she does case management mm -hmm. for elders, um, and she was wondering if it was appropriate to uh, report to a medical provider uh, or the DMV uh, uh, if she suspects maybe a driving concern, and you know her. Her, she she wants to make sure everybody's safe, but she's also trying to balance the needs, you know, to uh, respect the client's confidentiality. Absolutely. Um, if anybody, and that's why I included um, professional caregivers and everything in when I got to who can report. If you suspect, and that's why we allow you to stay confidential on our report form. If you suspect that anybody is a potential uh, traffic hazard or has a potential to injure themselves or others around them while driving, absolutely report them. You keep it confidential, guess what? You're not the bad guy. We're the bad guy, the DMV, the people that pe they don't like to go to us anyway. <laughs> so let us be the bad guy. I had several cases when I was a hearing officer where the person that was referring them would also come with that same person to be their moral support. And they never knew, that person never knew that the person sitting behind them Giving them moral support was the one that reported them because I did not, I cannot let them know. But that same person would argue for that person in front of me when we were in doing the contact. That's how our confidentiality works. Nobody but the hearing officer will ever know who reported them. They'll never know. So please, yes, if you suspect, we have no qualms doing it, at, at, like I said, at a minimal an investigation into it and see if we need to go further. All right, thank you. Um, we have uh, another question from a, a caregiver. Um, she wanted to know, um, is there such thing as, I guess, driver therapy, um, kind of like, you know, a physical or occupational therapy um, where you can kind of uh, work, work on ways to, to improve uh, with difficulties in driving or being able to maybe, uh, uh, you, you know, um, over, uh, you know, uh, uh, take some kind of therapy so it might help you drive better uh, or uh, aid in, you know, kind of uh, driving issues? Physically. I know in Southern California there's something like that out there. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as well organized in Northern California. So what we look at, um, like when I say a person needs to go get practice, you know, what we look at as far as that is the, uh, the same people that teach our sons and daughters at age 16 how to drive they usually are, are also capable of doing like a two or three hour refresher course and watching the person drive and critiquing them <clears throat> and getting them to remember some of the basics again because what we're looking at you know with a person over the age of 65 uh, are seniors uh, they've been driving on the road for multiple years uh, so what happens is bad habits form over time we forget to look over our shoulders we don't come to a complete stop all the time, stuff like that. And so it's just to get those bad habits out of the way, you know, to kind of remember, oh, yeah, I need to do this. Um, 
but as far as therapy, I know Southern California has a real good system set up. I know there's about 200 uh, professional therapists that go through and, and, and observe driving and, and do that, uh, especially for uh, the disabled uh, clients. Uh, but in Northern California, I haven't found anything similarly situated. Uh, as far as that, we rely a lot on uh, the people that uh, give our teenagers uh, their initial driving instruction here in Northern California. I'm not sure about the Bay Area. I would have to check with my uh, my other ombudsman here in uh, Oakland, uh, Rosemary Robles. She run, uh, she covers uh, the Bay Area for the most part, uh, so she would have better information about the Bay Area than I would. Okay, perfect. Thanks. I think we have uh, time for one more question. Um, again, if you're not able to, if you weren't able to get your uh, question answered, you could always um, give uh, Jared a call. Um, his uh, his number's on the screen. Uh, before I get to the last question, Jared, do you have the um, the web address of the um, Ombudsman um, program off the top of your head, just out of curiosity? Well, it's www.dmv.ca.gov. From there, I can't remember what the slashes are. But if you go to our main website um, and you hit the scroll down, it, it should say information for seniors. And you hit on that and it should take you right to our link, our direct link for uh, the senior senior driver ombudsman and everything that we provide on our website. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Yeah, I remember <laughs> it, was, it was actually quite easy to find uh, information, um, the senior ombudsman information. So um, I'm sure there should be no problems uh, if, you don't, uh, if you'd like to uh, contact them other than calling. Um, so the final question I had is, um, I know I was talking with you and actually one of your colleagues about kind of that, um, the talk uh, <laughs> that you mentioned before, but um, just uh, in terms of, you know, what it entails, uh, you know, if there's, um, if it's good to bring it up beforehand or, you know, just kind of some of the basics. I was wondering if you could just speak very briefly on, on uh, maybe some tips on how to think about having this talk, uh, what you should have in mind, uh, is it something you should be planning out, things like that. Well, it's absolutely something everybody should be planning out. Um, our advice is start early and, and be ready for it often. Uh, we look at um, talking with potential family members as early as 55 uh, because, once again, as our bodies grow older, uh, our reaction times slow down and everything like that, uh, we want to make sure that if the, per if the person does need to have the conversation about giving uh, up their privilege, that everybody involved helps develop the plan for the day after. Uh, what kind of transportation, who's going to provide it, when is it going to be provided, where do they need to go, that's part of the talk as well. And the final part um, is always make sure that uh, the people that are talking with, with the, the senior and it's time to give up, make sure that they've ridden with that person, you know, at least recently, so that they can help explain because of these actions that we're seeing, this is why we're talking about potentially having you stop driving. So all, all three of those factors are the biggest components of, of what needs to happen when it's time to have that discussion with the person and it's time for them to give up their keys. Fantastic, thanks. It seems like so much in life uh, is, uh, and comes down to, uh, to good planning and you know, a little bit of foresight and planning. Um, and certainly that's, uh, that's great advice about how, you know, having someone, you know, along for the ride just so they can actually specific, give specific answers that says, well, you know, this, that, you know, and the other thing is why we, we think it might be, you know, time to have this discussion. Um, I would also like to mention that um, in addition to um, all of Jared's resources and the um, California uh, Senior Ombudsman resources, um, Family Caregiver Alliance has a fact sheet. It's called Dementia and Driving. Um, if you go to our website, www.caregiver.org, you can find it. Probably the easiest way to find it is um, if you go into the search field, just type in dementia and driving. It should uh, pop right up. It comes, um, it'll talk about some things that, you know, Jared has gone over, like, um, you know, some of the signs, um, some of the monitoring things. I think, like, um, you know, Jared has mentioned, or, or even, like, kind of, we call it co-piloting, just kind of sitting around and, and kind of checking to see how they're doing. Um, and kind of goes into things like, you know, alternative transport and kind of reducing needs. So it's a, another resource if you're interested um, to check out on our website. Um, so I think that's all the time we have now for today. Uh, I would really like to thank again um, Jared for uh, spending the hour with us, uh, answering uh, so many questions, uh, fighting the uh, notorious uh, San Francisco Bay Area traffic. Um, at least on the way out, he should uh, have a little bit of an easier time. 
Um, so, you know, our FCA webinars are a free and continuing series. Um, they uh, are posted on our um, uh, webpage after time. Um, if you'd like more information about our webinars, um, you can always give me a call, um, ask for Calvin. Um, Otherwise, uh, our, next web our next webinar will be posted on our website if you'd like more information. Um, and this one, of course, will too be on our website uh, after a certain amount of time. So again, um, thank you, Jared, for uh, joining us today. Not a problem. It was a pleasure. Great. Um, so the webinar is now concluded, and we hope to see you uh, uh, all next time for our next webinar. Uh, have a great afternoon.